Hello, and welcome back to 15 Minutes of Philosophy, where we cram very complex philosophical debates that have been going on for centuries into 15 minutes or less. Today, we will be diving further into the mysterious world of dualism. Philosophers have been dueling for centuries over the plausibility of the mind being separate from the body. Is the mind a result of some biological processes? Can every thought of mind be traced back to some physical reaction? Or is the mind something else entirely? Is it a concept of its own, unable to be understood or replicated? Today, to look further into these questions, we are joined by two guests. Let's welcome the first one, Ed Kartz. Hi everyone, I'm Ed Cart. Thanks for having me on. I've dedicated my life's work to philosophy and theism. I'm a man of faith and one who believes in the separation of mind and body. Thanks, Ed. Moving on to our second guest, Pappy Nose. Hi everyone, I'm Pappy Nose, a fellow philosopher from Britain. I was born in Italy though, and I've been interested in what the brain really is for a good time now. You bet. Finally, I'm Amy Mind, and this is 15 Minutes of Philosophy. Today, we're going to be focusing on one prominent argument that supports dualism, or non-physicalism. It's called the zombie argument. For a brief history on this particular take, the zombie argument we'll be discussing was popularized in the 1990s by David Chalmers and is a version of a broader category of arguments against physicalism. Chalmers uses the idea of a philosophical zombie, which can be thought of as a creature who is physically identical to a conscious human, but lacks all phenomenal conscious experiences. Such a zombie would be unable to actually feel pain, but would still behave and respond as if it could. A zombie would be able to mimic the actions of someone in love, but would never be able to experience love itself. The central feature of the zombie definition is that one would be unable to distinguish between such a zombie and a conscious human, because by definition their behaviors are the same. Now that we have defined what Chalmers means by a zombie, let's get into the structure of the argument. Here's what it claims. One. Philosophical zombies, creatures that are physically identical to conscious beings but lack the experiential consciousness entirely, are conceivable. Two, if zombies are conceivable, then they are possible. Three, therefore, zombies are possible. Four, if zombies are possible, then experiential consciousness is non-physical. Five, therefore, consciousness is non-physical. Before we get into it, I just wanted to point out the zombie argument relies heavily on what philosophers call the conceivability argument. Proponents of the conceivability argument claim that the ability to clearly conceive of a given entity X means that the existence of X is logically possible. Their essential claim is that conceivability can imply possibility. The conceivability argument was first put forth by René Descartes, who is known as the father of dualism. In his sixth meditation, Descartes identifies the conceivability argument as possible through which to defend dualism. Obviously, there are many complexities within the structure of this argument and many missing definitions in what I just summarized, but we'll let the experts work those out. The conceivability argument can generally be laid out like this. One. Whatever is clearly and distinctly conceivable is possible. Two, I can clearly and distinctly conceive the mind existing without the body. Three, thus it is possible for the mind to exist without the body. Four, if it is possible for A to exist without B, then A and B are distinct entities. Five, thus the mind and the body are distinct entities dualism is true. Notice that the zombie argument depends on the conceivability argument, because it argues that if we can clearly conceive of something, the something in this case being zombies, then zombies are possible. However, there is still quite a debate on whether this is a valid argument to make. Now, let's hear from our guests, Ed Cart first. What exactly is meant by this argument? Thanks, Amy. To put it in basic terms, try to imagine something that is both round and square. It's hard, right? 
Since I failed to clearly and distinctly conceive of it, it's probably not possible. This is because in our three-dimensional reality, a single object cannot be fully round and fully square. Such an object is logically incoherent, and therefore its existence is not possible. But with the zombie argument, I can conceive of such a creature whose physical structure is exactly similar to my own, but whose existence differs in the way that the creature cannot feel or experience in the same way that I can. The fact that I am able to clearly conceive of this zombie implies logical coherence, and therefore means that this is that its existence is logically possible. Thank you, Ed. Mr. Nose, you seem to be dying to jump in here. What do you think of this point? Thank you, Amy. Now it seems like you, Ed, reference a specific type or definition of conception. If you're referring to all types of conception, for example, I can clearly conceive of a flying pig, and yet we know that flying pigs don't exist, so how do you explain that? I get where you're coming from, but possibility comes in a bunch of different flavors here. When we talk about conception's relationship with possibility, we're talking about logical possibility, not physical or empirical possibility. That's the difference. Flying pigs may very well exist somewhere, since there is nothing that is in inherently contradictory when conceiving of a flying pig. Think about it this way. You can conceive of a fragile ceramic plate, correct? Correct. And you can conceive of a fragile ceramic plate breaking if it were to fall off a table, right? Yeah, of course. I'm unsure if I see the relevance here. Well, you can likely also conceive of a fragile ceramic plate falling off a table and not breaking, correct? I suppose that has happened once or twice, sure. And so, you are saying that you can conceive of something fragile not breaking upon impact. Upon first thought, you may think this of this as illogical. The very definition of fragility is the susceptibility to breaking. Yet, you can imagine it not breaking clearly. Though most times when a ceramic plate falls, it will shatter. There's a non-zero probability that one day it will fall and not break. That's what conceivability is about, mere probability. We can confidently say that pigs do not fly, but one day, even if the possibility is super slim, they may. This makes it possible. What has to be made clear is that the conceivability argument does not try to establish the physical existence of a conceivable thing. Rather, it uses conceivability to establish logical coherence. From logical coherence, or the absence of contradiction, we can extend to logical possibility. Sure, but I'm still not that convinced. How do we know if we're conceiving of something correctly? Or if what we even think of as conceiving is even conception at all? For example, if your understanding of conception holds, we should be able to accurately conceive of our own brain. However, I know very little of the brain's physical structure and would definitely not be able to accurately conceive of the tens of billions of neurons that meticulously constitute the brain and its activity. That's true, but I would argue that you only need to have a sufficient understanding of what's possible for this understanding of conception to hold true. My counter to your point is that when conceiving of raising my own hand, we don't need to understand how every muscle fiber and tendon are interacting to produce this movement. I have a sufficient understanding of it to know that it's possible. Sure, but sufficiency is kind of a hard line to agree upon or even define. Like, how much even is sufficient? I can say that I can imagine a vampire because I have a sufficient amount of understanding of what constitutes a vampire, but I don't really think that would insinuate the possibility of its, ex of its existence. That's true that the line is hard to set, but the line must be set somewhere, right? Where the line is set, or if it's even possible for it to be set, is among the key discussions in evaluating the strength of this argument. Using arguments that you know are circular, or rather, arguments that you know are inherently implausible, is pointless. The nature of the mind-body argument suggests that we truly have no idea if it is plausible or implausible. Or at least, at least by the nature of physics and neglecting theory. The theory of dualism works to confront ambiguous phenomena. And if you could see the potential of ambiguity occurring... Perhaps it is not that ambiguous in the first place. Setting this aside for the moment, however, you are a physicalist, correct? You would be correct, Ed. Chalmers would argue that even if monists find the conception of a zombie to be confusing, they bear the same burden of proof. They need to explain exactly what they're confused about and why. That's true. Though, thinking about what we've discussed with, within futurism, this could almost relate. If future physics tells us that the mind and the body are the same thing, we might become unable to conceive of a zombie, which then flips the argument on its head. In that sense, I feel like the argument is relatively circular, because 
in the process of imagining the existence of a zombie, we almost make the assumption that the mind and the body are separate in the first place. For example, if we did know that the mind and the body were the same thing, then this conception literally becomes impossible. Can we even concretely make this assumption in the first place? Isn't that presumptuous to base a theory on some sort of non-verified claim? Is futurism not dependent on the fact that physics will develop to a point where these questions are solved? Are we even certain that it will occur? And consequently, is that not just as presumptuous? Isn't using a reasoning based on present uncertainty, based on contested ideas, more founded than relying on future knowledge that we aren't even certain will ever come to possess? Let's move on from the conceivability possibility argument. Assuming that something being conceivable implies that it is possible, can we automatically draw conclusions about the nature of body and mind? Not necessarily. I'd say that it's still pretty hard to conceive of this in the first place. See, that's the thing. Even if you can't conceive of a zombie, you're arguing that something that someone without consciousness aka a zombie, needs something over and above the physical to exhibit the same behavior as regular humans do. In this way, you think you're defending a modest position, but you're actually just supporting the dualist view. People might not believe to imagine a zombie without consciousness that has the exact same behaviors as a person. After all, we can agree that that thought is super unnatural. Well, imagine a wholly mechanical robot that is sophisticated enough that it could imitate all human behaviors. People can usually imagine a robot in place of the zombie, and it doesn't have any logical incoherence. So therefore, the same logic of the zombie argument stands. I guess that might convince some people, but still, there are always going to be people that don't believe that zombies are conceivable. They just can't conceive of a world where zombies don't have consciousness, but can still express deep sadness or love. They can't imagine zombies with any sort of imagination or creativity with absolutely no conscious experience. See, that's the thing. Even if you can't conceive of a zombie, you're arguing that something that someone without consciousness, aka a zombie, needs something over and above the physical to exhibit the same behavior as regular humans do. In this way, you think you're defending a modest position, but you're actually just supporting the dualist view. Wait, what? I thought if I couldn't imagine a zombie, then I'm arguing against dualism. Yes, but your justification for doing so is a dualist one. You're saying that without purely mental consciousness, zombies cannot perform certain things. This means that men mental consciousness is a separate thing from the body, because if it were the same thing, zombies would be able to do everything we're already doing. This makes things really weird, because it almost seems like the zombie argument is a double bind. Either you believe zombies exist, in which the case the mind and the body can be separated, or you cannot conceive of a world in which zombies exist because you think they must have something over and above the physical. This stuff is really confusing, right? That's why these arguments are so hard to resolve, and they're up for a debate today. Dualism has plenty of arguments for and against it, and the zombie argument is just one of many. By critically analyzing its validity, we can get a better sense of the debate within philosophy of mind and keep us thinking about the nature of thinking. And looks like that's time. Thank you all for tuning in, folks. Did any argument speak to you more than the other? Be sure to reach out with any feedback. Next week, we'll be touching on Thomas Nagel's What's It Like to Be a Bat? So be sure to tune in. All right, that's all for me. This was this week's episode of 15 Minutes of Philosophy. Amy Mind, signing out.